Nehemiah chapter number 7. Last week we looked at Nehemiah chapter number 6, talking about how to deal with opposition. And anytime we try to do anything for the Lord, there will be those who will oppose that. Uh, our enemy is still very alive and well, and uh, he doesn't want to see the work of the Lord go on or continue. Uh, let me say we ought to have all of our brothers and sisters in Christ in, in prayer. Uh, churches of like faith in prayer. Uh, the devil wants to attack and destroy. It's heartbreaking, some of the things that go on. We need to understand how to deal with that opposition. And we talked about considering the source and all of those things. And of course, knowing the, the source of our own strength um, is important as well. And uh, we're going to get into Nehemiah chapter number 7 here and uh, talk about the completion of one of the main goals that Nehemiah had. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And Lord, we're, we're so thankful as we heard in that song that you are in control. And so Lord, you see us and you know what the circumstances that we face. You know the problems that we're going through. And uh, Lord, we... No, ultimately, the, all these things are for your honor and your glory, and I pray that you'd help us to see life from your point of view instead of our very earthly and selfish point of view. Lord, as we spend some time in your word tonight, we're thankful, we're thankful to hold the preserved word of God in our hands that we might study it and know it for ourselves. But Lord, not just have information, but to do something with it. I pray that we might take Nehemiah chapter number 7 and apply it to our lives Starting tonight, Lord, that going away this week, we might practice the things that we've heard both in the teaching hour this morning in our life groups, in the morning service, talking about the blood covenant and the, all the things that are available to us if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And tonight, as we look at Nehemiah chapter number 7, I pray that you would help us uh, to take these things and do something with them. And Lord, once again, we're going to be speaking to mostly Christians tonight, but if there's someone here without Jesus as their Savior, I know the Spirit of God doesn't need my help. Uh, Lord, He can convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, and draw them to the Lord Jesus Christ, that they may put their faith in Jesus and be saved tonight. And I pray that that may be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get in here to... Chapter number 7 of the book of Nehemiah. Verse number 1 says, now, when it came to, or now it came to pass, when the wall was built, and I had set up the doors. And it uh, seems that set it, putting the doors in the gates was the last thing that they needed to do. You remember last week as we opened up Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse number 1, it says, now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall, and that there was no breach left therein. Now notice, notice the little parenthesis. It says, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. So the walls were built, but the doors weren't put on. And, and how important the doors are. And uh, here we find, as we get into chapter number 7, the wall is built, and the doors have been set in place. And so we find one of the great accomplishments that Nehemiah came to do is completed. And uh, we need to be careful about uh, meeting certain goals, going through certain victories, uh, because it's at those times often that we let our guard down, that we're kind of relaxed. You know, think about it when you're trying to lose weight or something else. You've got a certain goal. I want to hit this certain weight. What happens when we hit that weight? We kind of let off the brakes a little bit. I've hit the goal weight, now I can eat whatever I want, you know, dr you know, have the sodas and all that sort. We let our guard down. And sometimes spiritually we do the same thing. We might set a goal. God, I'm going to read my Bible every morning for a month and spend time in prayer every morning for a month. Well, we hit the month and then it's kind of, we just kind of, well, I made my goal, we let our guard down. Well, here the goal is met, but Nehemiah is not going to let his guard down. In fact, we find one of the first things that he does, it tells us, it, uh, they got the door set up, and uh, he says, and the porters were appointed 
Those are the gatekeepers. The ones who are going to watch the doors and pay attention to who's coming in and who's going out and all of those things. And man, what an important position that that was. Many great civilizations, many great cities were conquered. Not because somebody breached the walls and, and bore through, went up, over, or under. It's because of the person who was keeping the doors. If they could just bribe them, if they could just get to them. Very important position. But Nehemiah establishes a watch right from the very beginning. And so we find the gatekeepers are put in place. And uh, he also notes the singers and the Levites were appointed. Of course, those were, they were the ones who would uh, lead the worship of the people. And so Nehemiah didn't fail to uh, handle the spiritual aspect of what was going on as well, giving praise uh, to God uh, for what was going to happen. And so Nehemiah is, is an amazing leader who keeps track of things, very organized and has a system for what he's going to do and is always on guard and always vigilant. And it tells us we're going to have a little time of transition here. He says, once all these things were established, we built the walls, set up the doors on the gates, we got the gatekeepers established, the singers and Levites are appointed... He says that I gave my brother, Hanani, and Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. Now, remember one of the cries against and false accusations against Nehemiah was you came to set up yourself as king. You came to establish this up for yourself and you hired out prophets to talk about there's a king in Jerusalem and all this stuff. Remember what he said? No, that's not true. This thing doesn't happen. That's something you made up out of your own heart. Nehemiah never came to set himself up as the king. That wasn't the purpose. The purpose was so that the children of Israel would be no more a reproach. That the walls could be built up, the gates could be built up, and they'd be to a place where they were established once again. And so when this major milestone has taken place, then he sets up and establishes uh, a change of leadership here. He sets up his brother, Hanani. And uh, remember, we saw him in Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse number 2. It tells us that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And, of course, he then gives the report, the, the terrible report of what had happened there. The oppression, the gates burned with fire and all that stuff. But his brother is the one who brought him the report there. And so he is put in a position of leadership. And then we have Hananiah, uh, the ruler of the palace. He's put in a position of leadership as well. And I find it interesting here that you have uh, Hanani, which means gracious. And then you have Hananiah, which means favored of God. Now, these are the ones, and if you really break it down, what those words mean, it's, it's the idea of grace and grace. Grace upon grace is established as the leadership here in Jerusalem. But notice what it says about Hananiah. It says, for he was a faithful man. You know, he's a man of integrity. That uh, Nehemiah didn't just put anybody in charge. He didn't just like point out the room and say, all right, you're the one. Uh, no, there was a reason behind the people that he put in charge. And he's a man of integrity. He's got character. Uh, you notice also he's a man of great spiritual faith. It tells us that he was a faithful man and feared God above many. Feared God. And man, what a thing that's lacking in our world today is a fear of God. We so downplayed God in our society. We've downplayed the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, as he's our, he's our buddy and he's our pal and whatever else. And, and that is true. He is our friend. But you can't ignore the fact that he is the holy God. And there's a certain way we ought to approach him. There's a certain amount of respect that we ought to have for who he is and what he can do. And this was a guy who greatly feared God. And I think about those men and women throughout the scripture that tells us that they feared God. 
uh, to the point that they cared more about what God thought and said than what anybody else thought or said. In Exodus 1, verses 16 and 17, the Bible says, And he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And here you have these these women here, and in Exodus chapter number 1, it names a couple of them for us, these midwives. And he told them, listen, if they have the baby, that's fine and great, but if it's a male child, you're, you kill it. If it's a female, then let her live. Now, they, those women had a choice to make at that point. Either we're going to fear the king of Egypt, we're going to fear Pharaoh, or we're going to fear God. These women decided they would fear God more than they would fear the king. You have Job chapter number 1 and verse number 1. The Bible says there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil, hated evil. Uh, he was a man who feared God. Man, think about what Job went through. Uh, Job was, had such a walk with the Lord that God used him as an example of faithfulness uh, to Satan himself. Man, what a powerful testimony there. This is the type of person that Hananiah is associated with because of his fear of God. Of course, in the New Testament, you have Acts chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. This man named Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. And there's a reason why Nehemiah chose these men to put in charge over Jerusalem, the type of man that he was. Anytime I read a description of someone in the Scripture, it always challenges me to think about what God would say about me. How would He choose to describe me? I mean, would God look at you and say, man, there's a person who's faithful. They're faithful to me. They're faithful to my people. They're faithful to my word. I mean, there's, there's not a lot of people who are faithful anymore to anything. You can't even, you know, talk to some of these people who own businesses. They can't even find good work. You can't even find people who will stick around and work. It's tough. There's no faithfulness. Look at marriages today. There is no faithfulness. If God looked down at you, would he describe you? Would he describe me as somebody who's faithful to him? Would he say, hey, there's a person who fears God. That man, that woman, that teenager, they fear me more than they fear anybody else. I mean, that's an amazing thing to be said. Very challenging. Continue on, verse number 3. And I said unto them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun be hot. And while they stand by, let them shut the doors and bar them and appoint watches of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, every one in his watch and every one to be over against his house. Now, Nehemiah understood that his enemies were still out there. There were those that didn't like to see what was going on. They didn't like to see the progress. Uh, they didn't like to see the victories and other things that they were accomplishing. And so he says, we, got, we have to be careful. Now, most of the time, a city would, ha would have their gates open from sunup to sundown. Um, you know, you go back into Revelation chapter number 21. It says the gates aren't going to be shut at all because there is no night there. The custom was to have the gates closed when it was dark out. You know, as soon as it starts to get light out, you open up the gate until it starts to get dark, and then you close them again. Not the case here. Um, the enemies were around. He says, you don't open up that gate until it's the hot part of the day. We're only going to keep these gates open for a little bit at a time, a few hours at a time. If you want to go in and out, that's your time to do it. And, and you notice kind of the way that it describes the watch. They were so careful that, hey, when you come up to the gate, we're going to un unlatch it, we're going to open it, you come through, then we're going to close it and latch the door again. So there's a few hours where you can get through. Otherwise, it's barred and it's sealed. We're going we're gonna to watch. And they put people in uh, to 
put up guards and put up watches. And we need to be careful about letting our guard down. Remember, as we talked about a few weeks ago, we have an adversary that wants to destroy us. He tells us, you better be sober, you better be vigilant, you better watch. Jesus told Peter, watch and pray. You don't let your guard down. What happened? Peter let his guard down. He fell asleep. And what happened? He fell into temptation. He lost the victory because he let his guard down. Nehemiah says, we can't do that. And then, of course, he says, and everyone to be over against his house. And so we're watching in places that are important to us. And, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why I, I try not to force people to serve at a certain place. You know, I want people to serve where they feel like God has made them to serve. You know, if you, if you have an investment in something, you're going to take care, better care of it. The difference between renting something and owning something in our world today. You know, if you own a house, most of the time you're going to take good care of it. People that rent them oftentimes don't. Now, that's not a blanket statement, but I know a lot of people who own houses and rent them out. I know the history. He says, I want you to have a, a, a piece of this. I want you to have a, a dog in the race. You watch over against your house. You know whose yard and whose house I watch close eye on? It's mine. I pay attention to who's walking around my house. Sometimes people cut through the yard, whatever else. I'm watching. I want to know who's around my family. He says, we're going to put up a watch right here. We ought to have a watch over our own homes. You ought to be careful about what you let into your home. You ought to be careful about who you let into your home. The influences and all those sorts of things. He says, you put up a watch, everyone over against his house. And then he says in verse 4, now the city was large and great, but the people were few therein, and the houses were not built. And see, this is going to make it even more difficult to defend the city. The walls don't defend themselves. The gates don't defend themselves. It takes people to do that. Somebody's got to man the walls. Somebody's got to man the doors and watch them to protect them. And so we've got a situation here where we've got a large city, but we've got few people. And at this point, they haven't even taken time to build up the broken down houses. We get to verse number 5, and he says, And my God put into mine heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people, that they might be reckoned by genealogy. I find this phrase here at the beginning of verse number 5 quite interesting. Nehemiah was a man who paid attention to what God was speaking to him about. He paid attention to that. Think of Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse number 12. He says, And I arose in the night, I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. You see, God had put it in his heart to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls and the gates and establish the community there. God had put that in his heart. Now, once again, God is speaking to him. He's letting him know, hey, just like we took a survey of, of the city to see what needed to be done, let's take a survey of the population. We'll see what's going on here. Let's see what we're working with. But he's listening to what's going on in his heart. In our world today, there's not a lot of places where we can just get quiet and listen to God speaking to our heart. I'm guilty of that oftentimes. You know, whether I'm, I'm just working, doing kind of mindless work on my computer, I like to have something going. I like to have music. I like to have something going that I can listen to. And I'm guilty of that as well not spending enough time just in the quietness, asking God to speak to me, allowing Him to speak. We, you know, so often we, we have the things and the sounds of this world just kind of drowned out what it is that God wants to speak to us about. Think of 1 Kings 19, verses 11 and 12. Many of you know this very well. And He said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, talking to Elijah. 
And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Nehemiah paid attention to that voice. He was always listening. And he had a heart like Samuel. God crying out to Samuel, Samuel, Samuel! Once Samuel realized and recognized who it was, thanks to Eli's help, what did he say? Here am I, Lord. What do you need? That's the way Nehemiah was. He was listening for what the Lord wanted him to do. Now, I might challenge each of us to stop and to consider what it is, is the Lord speaking to you about. In the quietness of your heart, what is it that He's telling you? What is it that He's challenging you about? What is it maybe that He's reproving you for? But if you take some time to listen, I guarantee you He's speaking. Most of the time we don't, t we don't listen. But it says here, he's going to do what God put in his heart to do. And so God had put in his heart that he's going to gather together all these people and reckon them by genealogy. And it tells us that, and I found a register of the genealogy of them which came up at the first and found written therein. Okay, so he's going to open up this register and uh, see the names and the numbers of the people who came. And he lets us know the names of who we're talking about here. Verse 6, These are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity, of those that had been carried away from Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon had carried away, and came again to Jerusalem and to Judah, everyone unto his city. So here's a list of names of people that were living in Israel... Then King Nebuchadnezzar came and deported them to Babylon, and now they've come back. So, as we stop and read these names tonight, we're going to read every name. I don't promise to read them correctly. We're going to read these names. They're important names. Because all these people chose to go back. There were a lot of people that didn't go back. They were happy in Babylon. They were comfortable in Babylon. They had the opportunity to return, and they chose not to for whatever reason. And we're going to see as we get to the end of this chapter that some of them were very wealthy in Babylon, and yet they still chose to come back. Many times, rather than staying where we ought to be, we choose to live in Babylon. We choose to live in sin. We choose to live in our selfishness. These people didn't do that. They said, hey, whatever the cost, whatever the sacrifice, we're going back. We're going back to where our God is. We're going back to where our people is, where the land that He promised to us. And so when we think about these names, anytime you read through the Bible, don't just take something for granted. It's put there for a reason. I believe every word is put there for a reason. But man, when I think about these people here and the sacrifice that they were willing to make to return back to Jerusalem... I'm reminded of Demas. Think about what the Apostle Paul said about Demas. Demas hath forsaken me, loving this present world. Many times we're just like Demas. You know, we, we forsake the Lord. For this world. For the things that it has to offer. There's nothing that this world has to offer that will prove greater and more rewarding than what God has to offer. But these are the names we're going to read. They're the ones. They were taken in captivity. They could have stayed there. Many did. But they chose to come back. And so God records their names here in the Scripture for us to read. Verse number 7. And just follow along with me. We're going to read quite a few names and get through quite a few of these verses here right now. So here's the names. Who came with Zerubbabel, Joshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Rehemiah, Nehemiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispereth, 
Bigvi, Nehem, Baana. The number, I say, of the men of the people of Israel was this. The children of Perosh, 2,172. The children of Shephatiah, 372. The children of Ara, 650 and 2. The children of Pahath Moab, of the children of Jeshua and Joab, 2,818. The children of Elam, 1,250 and 4. The children of Zatu, 840 and 5. The children of Zakai, 703 score. The children of Benuai, 640 and 8. The children of Bebai, 620 and 8. The children of Asgad, 2,320 and 2. The children of Adonikim, 603 score and 7. The children of Bigvi, 2,003 score and 7. The children of Aden, 650 and 5. The children of Ater, of Hezekiah, 90 and 8. The children of Hashem, 320 and 8. The children of Bezai, 320 and 4. The children of Harith, 112. The children of Gibeon, 90 and 5. The men of Bethlehem and Natophah, 104 score and 8. The men of Anathoth, 120 and 8. The men of Beth Asmaveth, 40 and 2. The men of Kirjath Jerim, uh, Kephirel, and Beeroth, 740 and 3. The men of Ramah and Geba, 620 and 1. The men of Michmas, 120 and 2. The men of Bethel and Ai, 120 and 3. The men of the other Nebo, 50 and 2. The children of the other Elam, 1,250 and 4. The children of Haran, 320. The children of Jericho, 340 and 5. The children of Lob, Hadid, and Ono, 720 and 1. The children of Sinea, 3,930. The priests, the children of Jediah, of the house of Jeshua, 970 and 3. The children of Immer, 1,050 and 2. The children of Pashur, 1,240 and 7. The children of Harim, 1,017. The Levites, the children of Jeshua, of Kadmiel, and of the children of Hodiva, 70 and 4. The singers, the children of Asaph, 140 and 8. The porters, remember that's the gatekeepers. The children of Shalom, the children of Ater, the children of Talman, the children of Akub, the children of Hadatah, the children of Shaboai, 130 and 8. The Nethanims, the children of Zia, the children of Hashva, the children of Teboath, the children of Kiros, the children of Saya, the children of Padon, the children of Lebanon, the children of Hagabah, the children of Shalmai, the children of Hanan, the children of Gedel, the children of Geher, the children of Riah, the children of Reason, the children of Nikoda, the children of Gazim, the children of Uzzah, the children of Fasia, the children of Bezai, the children of Menuhim, the children of Nephesism, the children of Bakba, the children of Hakufa, the children of Harher, the children of Bazleth, the children of Mahida, the children of Harsha, the children of Barkas, the children of Sisera, the children of Tama, the children of Neziah, the children of Hadapha, the children of Solomon's servants, the children of Satiah, the children of Sapphareth, the children of Parida, the children of Jaela, the children of Darkon, the children of Giddel, the children of Shephatiah, the children of Hattel, the children of Pachareth, of Zebaim, the children of Ammon, all the Nethanims, all the children of Solomon's servants were 390 and 2. And these were they which were went up also from Telmila and Telherisha, Kirab, Adon, and Immer.
but they could not show their father's house nor their seed, whether they were of Israel. So here we have some individuals who couldn't trace their heritage. They weren't sure. They have come from a certain city, but they didn't know exactly what their heritage was. And so it tells us the children of Deliah, the children of Tobiah, the children of Nekoda, 640 and 2, and of the priests, the children of Hebiah, the children of Koz, the children of Barzillai, which took one of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, to wife and was called after their name. And interesting study on the life of Barzillai and his interaction with David. We won't take time to do that now, but you can look that up later. This is one of his descendants here. These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but it was not found. Therefore, they were as polluted, put from the priesthood. And so remember, there were very specific stipulations as far as who could be in the priesthood and who could offer the sacrifices and all those sorts of things. You had to know where your heritage and where your genealogy had come from. And so until that could be proven, uh, we're going to consider you as someone whose their genealogy has been polluted and uh, you cannot hold to this office. Uh, verse 65, And the Tershatha said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and Thummim. And so they said, Once the priest gets here and can observe the Urim and Thummim, then uh, we'll figure out the genealogy and where you came from and all those sorts of things. It says the whole congregation together was 40 and 2,300 and three score. And one of the things I find so fascinating is uh, God knew every single one of them. Every single one of them, He knew them. And uh, I'm thankful for that. He said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. He knows His people. And there are some times where we feel like maybe nobody else cares and nobody else knows. God knows. He sees and He cares. And you think about what He said, Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season ye shall reap if ye faint not. God knows what we're doing. God knew the sacrifice that every single one of these people made to return back to the nation of Israel, to return back to that land. And He recognizes them here for that. And uh, I believe men and women of faith that came back, and he knows every single one of them that came back. He pays attention to them. He knew their life. He knew where they were. And we can get, uh, you know, we can, fo- we, can, we can kind of fall off the ditch one way or another when it comes to numbers, if we're not careful. We can make numbers the focus, and, and so we're so focused on numbers, we don't really care about the people. And we can also say, well, I don't really care about numbers, but each, each number is, is a life. Each number is a soul. They, numbers are important in the right perspective. But God knew every single one of these people and uh, records them here for us. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at even the smallest of the numbers. Because it seems like the larger number from your group that's going back, the easier it is to go back. The smaller the group, the harder it is to go back. And yet they still made the choice that they were going to go back. Verse 67 says, Beside their manservants and their maidservants, of whom they were 7,330 and 7, they had 240 and 5 singing men and singing women, their horses... 730 and 6, their mules, 240 and 5, their camels, 430 and 5, 6,720 asses. And some of the chief of the fathers gave unto the work. And so here we're going to see that these weren't necessarily, they're going back because we're so poor here, we're so destitute here, it, it, you know, it can't get worse, let's go back. Some of these people were very wealthy. They were ve- very well off. And uh, we find that the the heads of the clans here were giving to the work of the Lord. It says in verse 70, the the Tershatha, 
gave to the treasurer a thousand drams of gold, fifty basins, five hundred and thirty priest garments. And some of the chief of the fathers gave to the treasurer of the work twenty thousand drams of gold and two thousand two hundred pounds of silver. And that which the rest of the people gave was twenty thousand drams of gold and two thousand pounds of silver and threescore and seven priest garments. And here we find the people not just getting involved with the work themselves they did, but they were willing to give to the work of the Lord as well. They went back. And they're recognized for it. It says, so the priests and the Levites and the porters and the singers and some of the people and the Nethanims and all Israel dwelt in their cities. And when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. Now that seven month is important because that's when the fall feast would take place. And so by the time those fall feasts came around, they were in their cities ready to serve the Lord and to praise Him with those feasts that were coming. What a challenge. They went back. It makes me stop and consider the things that I'm doing for the Lord. Do I fear Him more than anything else? Do I love Him more than anything else? More than anything this world has to offer. They didn't have to come back. They chose to come back. And not everybody came back. Most people stayed. They stayed in Babylon. But these ones right here, God said, I don't want to forget their names. They're the ones who chose to come back to the promised land, to do the work that God had for them to do. God knew their names and He was keeping track of everything they were doing. I think the same is true for every single one of us. God knows your name. He knows what you're doing. Nobody else may see. God sees, God knows, and He will not forget. He didn't forget one of these people. He's not going to forget you either.